Good morning, gospel community. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, it's great to be with you guys. So we have a, another exciting morning because we have two more baby dedications. Come on. It's awesome. So I'm going to invite up uh, the families together, and we'll have them stand. So I want the Whitmans and the Rays. If you guys can come on up here, we're going to stand in line up here. How are you guys? Just stand with your family. That would be good. If you're going to mix the families, it would be hard to get it out. <laughs> Come on up, you guys. Yeah, you go. Push it on over. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, so the workmen's are here, center station. We'll do the workmen's first. Uh, this is the workmen family. Say, say hi, church. Hi. No, you don't say hi, church. You just say hi. Let's try that again. Okay, hi, workmen's. How about that? One, two, three. Hi, workmen's. That's awesome. Welcome. So this is uh, Eric and Jen Workman, and this is their brood. This is their incredible family. Uh, I mean, their family too. Doesn't it look like it? I mean, that's what it looks like. Ginger power. Ginger yeah. power. You can be sisters. And Auntie. Auntie Nene. Auntie Nene. Oh, Auntie Nene. That's not. Auntie Nene. That's not. That's not. That's not. That's not. That's That's what I call her. I don't call her Auntie Nene. I just call her Nene. <laughs> So this right here, this little guy right here that Eric is holding, this is uh, Tanner Michael Wortman, but um, the family didn't want to be outdone by the last family baby dedication that we did with Lydia. I can't it's even say that. That was me. Oh, that's Ooh, actually good. Oh, no, 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 no. Say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so not to be outdone, this is Tanner the Bear and Mighty Chantor, Vroom Vroom, Chugga Chugga Beep Beep, and I'm working. And he lives up to that name all day. He was born, um, he was born, he's two years and a month old. How about that? He's ready to fly. He's ready to fly. He's a wild man. So this is what happens. So when I asked them, what are you seeing in most? This is what the family said. They said, we see something big in Bear. He has so much wonder, determination, and adventure in him. And when I said, what do you love about him most? The family said, we love how he has so much excitement for all things with wheels. You guys are in trouble. And how he loves his family, filled with fierce hugs and snuggles. Oh, yeah. There it is, right there. Yeah. his sister. We also love this favorite song that he made up called Hallelujah Tractor because he loves tractors. So that's his sister Blake. And now Jalen. And now, okay, you want Sky to hold you too, buddy? We can train him to do all that. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, you want to practice, guys. You practiced it. Okay. Tanner, do you want to say something, buddy? I mean, he's just a little mighty warrior. Like, I love this kid. I love him from the moment I saw him. And so I, um, as we were praying through that, yep, we're swapping again. Here we go. Here we go. Now, Sky. Sky, you got to hold him too. There we go. All right, Mama's hips are incredible. <laughs> Psalm 144, 1 through 2, it says, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. That's going to be you, bro. Okay? Is that cool? Cool. 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 All right, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for them. Okay. So, as a church, we love to be able to bring families up in front of um, each of us because we would love to be able to say that as a church, we're going to help. Pray for and support this family. So just as a sign of support, if you want to reach out your hands, um, just really just want a symbol of that we are here for you and that we're gonna um, just an agreement of praying over this sweet family. So God, we thank you so much for Tanner. God, we thank you, God, that you have made him a mighty warrior. And I ask Lord for your presence to be upon his life. I pray, God, that you would 
um, just be in the midst of this family, God. That no trial or tribulation would tempt them to flee from you, God, but it would push them towards you, propel them towards you. I pray that even on their hardest days that they would seek you for their parenting, for their discipline, for their joyous days, God. I pray that they would feel equipped by you, supported by you, loved by you, and supported by us as well, God. I pray that your hand would be on them, Lord, that they would um, just feel your presence even now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Did anyone see him looking between the eyes? No. He looked her between the eyes. We were all praying. Tanner, everybody, Grim Grim Bear, Chubby Chubby, BB, some of All right, now give a round of applause for the workers. Love you guys. Come on. 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 Uh, so I asked Cordelia this morning. I said, Miss Cordelia, are we going to pray for you? And she said, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. So she knows what's going to go down. So this is the Ray family. This is Brandon and Lydia. This is their incredible three children. This is Emily, William, and Cordelia. Um, and so we're going to we're going to pray over William. Okay. You can go sit down. Go sit down. Right. We'll still pray for you. It's okay. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Good to see you. Um, so this is Brandon and Lydia, and this is their sweet uh, daughter Cordelia, and her birthday was January 30th, so she's a year and nine months old, right? Yeah, okay. So, I said, what do you see in her most? And I asked the family, they said her name means warm-hearted, and they can truly see how warm and sweet her heart is, and so can we. She has her sassy moments. But she is her happiest when she's making other people happy. And so if you know Cordelia, she has the sweetest smile. And then if you do something funky, she's going to give you one of the side eyes. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she does it to me a lot. She's the sweetest. And then uh, I asked, what do you love about her most? Uh, Brenda and Lydia said, even though she is so young, she still understands so much. And they love how caring and giving she can be. Also, her smile is just the most contagious and sweet thing ever, and I have to say, so yes. <laughs> so when I was thinking about little Cordelia, <laughs> when I was thinking about little Cordelia, Proverbs 31, 25, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come because she know her, her hope is secure in Jesus, huh? So we're gonna pray for you. Can we pray for you now, Cordelia? Do you pray? Okay, she's good. Oh. And again, if you want to just reach out our hands to support the sweet family, God, we thank you for the gift that this family is. God, we pray for Brandon and Lydia, God, that they would feel your presence as they lead this um, sweet girl, God, that they would love their children as you do, God, that they would see Cordelia with your eyes. God, that she would bring such joy to their family, that she will continue to. Thank you for William. Thank you for Emily. And thank you you would just be with them. And God, that you would... Um, Touch the top of Cordelia's head all the way down to the bottom of her toes, God, that you would just find the enemy from her. God, we believe great things that can come from this sweet girl. We ask, God, for your protection over this family, God. We ask that through every uh, word that is spoken in their home, we ask that for uh, on their hardest days of discipline, on their joyous days of celebration, um, God, that they would um, just feel your presence on them, God. And as even as we giggle, God, we know that the gift of laughter does come from you, and the joy that we receive from our children can come from you. We thank you for this sweet girl. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's give it up for the Rays. So, if you have children, you can now dismiss your children. We have you guys follow Miss Deanna. I think Andy is there in the back. Yep, there they are. You guys can follow them on down. We'll see you all in a little bit. We love kids in our service, y'all. I seriously, I love kids in our service. Here's why. Let me just explain this again. I know that I've talked about this before. It's so important for kids to see us worshiping, to understand and to learn how to worship as we worship. So we love them. We bless you guys as you go. Love you. So this morning we're going to continue in our Timothy series, and uh, it is my honor and joy to always welcome up an incredible friend of mine. 
um, who has been an incredible pastor. He has pastored me and uh, been so incredible. So please join me in welcoming my friend and pastor, Matt Higgins. Good morning. Good morning. I'm with the big and tall microphone uh, speaker. Anyways, I've known Mike for about 13 years off and on. I've known Mike since before he could grow a beard, so. Um, yeah. He was like a child man, and he's grown to this just godly, awesome man who loves you, he loves Jesus, he loves the church. Um, and I'm so blessed to be a part of his life and have him to be part of mine. Mike is somebody who encouraged me when no one else did. Mm. Mike is someone who's, who believed in me when really no one else did. And for that, it just changed my life. So thank you, Mike. But one of the things that we do, I mentioned this earlier um, when I was talking to some people, is that in the church we invite people into ministry. We invite people to be part of what we're doing because that's what God does. And so this morning I'm going to invite my friend Colby to share God's word with us as he just, he's going to read the scripture and then we will talk. So Colby, can you This is a trustworthy saying, if someone aspires to be an elder, he desires an honorable position. So an elder must be a man whose life is above approach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. And he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not wholesome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? An elder must not be a good believer, because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fail. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him, so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. They must be, not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith in our view and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be tested. And if they pass the test, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not sign their others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. The deacon must be faithful to his wife and he must manage his children and household well. Amen. So you guys pray with me. Dear God, we just thank you that we get to be in this place. It's a beautiful, beautiful space. As we look and see that creation declares the glory of God. There's beautiful trees around us. But God, we ask that you would declare your glory to us this morning as we open your word. That you would open our eyes to see you. We'd open our hearts to understand all that you have for us in your word. Help us to hear you. Help us to see you. Help us to respond to you this morning. In your name, amen. So today, obviously, we're talking about church leadership, the roles of elders and deacons. Um, and I, there's a lot of really, I was thinking, this is a very important job in church. You know, leaders of the church, that's important. And there's really a lot of important types of jobs in the world that require, like, advanced knowledge, lots of experience, and intelligence. For example, like astronauts. Astronauts require a lot of you know, skill and intelligence. It's a pretty dangerous job. You know, this rocket is a complex machine. And you're on this spacecraft, hurling at 2,300 miles per hour up into space. You're exploring places and seeing things that no one else will. And it's a very special position because so few people get to do it. Which is why I think that Jeff Bezos made the right decision when he chose William Shatner to climb aboard the rocket uh, last month. Because not only is William Shatner famous, which is an important quality in astronauts, he was Captain James T. Kirk 
on Star Trek of the USS Enterprise, so he's definitely qualified for the job. And as the oldest person in space, he boldly went where no 90-year-old ever gone before. It was awesome. Totally qualified. So picking astronauts is easy, right? It's easy stuff. But when it comes to the Church of God, how do you choose qualified leaders? Who gets to lead God's church and God's people? Today, as we take a look at Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, we see what God is looking for in the men and women who are the leaders in this church. So before we kind of dive into these requirements, just a, a quick word on kind of where the structure comes from. When the church started in the book of Acts, there was the 12 apostles, so 12 guys who were all kind of co-leaders of the church. And then as the church rapidly grew from 3,000 and beyond, they realized that they needed some help. And so they appointed men who would be deacons, and they would help with some of the practical matters of the church, serving food and doing some other things. And so really, as that happens, as the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. So as structure was put into place, it actually helped the word of God grow. It helped God's kingdom to grow and to flourish. And really, that kind of became the pattern, and that was the pattern for the first hundred years or so. And then, uh, after that point, it really kind of emerged where there would be one kind of lead, senior leader, one head elder, and then a group of elders who would lead the church and oversee the spiritual matters of things, and then there would be a group of deacons who would oversee the practical matters of things. So this morning, we'll look at both of these roles and what the requirements are for each one. So first of all, objections. Some of you are thinking, I don't want to be a leader. Why am I here? What does that have to do with me? Or, I'm 12 years old. Why do I need to know this? <laughs> um, here in chapter 3, we're really going to see two things. There's two things here in chapter 3. It's not just all about the requirements for leaders. We see a model and we see a map. A model of what godly church leadership looks like and a map of what Christian maturity looks like and how to get there. And so maybe you don't want to be a leader in the church, or, or maybe this is, you don't think this is for you, but listen, check this out. Each of us are called to Christian maturity. That's why in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, he says we should desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow. Later on, Christians in the book of Hebrews are called out because they're stuck on milk and they're not diving into meat. They're not growing. God is calling you and me to grow up in the faith. And before us, we see a map in 1 Timothy 3 of what Christian maturity looks like through the lens of leadership. And then some of you may be completely new to church. You've never been to church before. Somebody dragged you here and they said, hey, you want to go to Oakland? You're thinking like I'm getting cider donuts and hay rides and stuff, and then, and then you end up here. Um, we do have donuts, though, so there's that. Um, so why do you need to hear this? This morning, you're going to see a completely different standard of leadership. In our world, we measure our leaders by results often ignoring their character. Mm. We don't care what they do as long as we get there. And sometimes we'll even excuse bad character as long as we see the results or the agenda we agree with. But God has a completely different standard for the church and he begins with character. The kingdom of God is refreshingly different from what you see in the world. That's who God is. He's refreshingly different. He's completely other. So there's so much here in chapter 3 and I really don't have time to address it. Um, Mike said, gave me the passage, and I'm like, do I have four hours? Um, is, are we doing an all-day thing? Or what? Yeah. So by the time we're done here today, you're, you're not going to recognize your kids. They'll be a year older. Um, it's okay. We have bathrooms in the back. We can go. All right. There's so much here. Let's, I want to just kind of distill it down to three things that we're going to look at. Character, control, and commitment. These are the three areas that, that are important for God's leaders. Character, control, and commitment. So first we'll look at character. So I found this quote by Abraham Lincoln. He says, character is like a tree, and reputation is like a shadow. Like a tree, character is developed over time. It grows slowly when it's watered. It takes time to see what it's really going to be like. But once it's established, it's clearly seen by all. Over at Los Rios, or the Wildlands Conservancy, there's, in the very back, there's this children's forest. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It's interesting to me because it was planted the year that my daughter was born, 18 years ago, and now it's like this giant forest. The tree's like 40, 50 feet tall. And the cool thing about it is that when it started off, it didn't look like much, but now it's grown. But character takes time to grow. In Western culture, we love really two concepts. We love the, the concept of the self-made person who, through, through grit and determination, just kind of figure it out and make things happen. We also love the hero who has this innate moral character. They're just like good, like Superman. Um, courage, bravery, compassion. 
But godly character is completely different because it doesn't come from inside of us. We don't get it from our parents. We don't get it from our natural tendencies. Character is like a tree, and the Bible describes how that tree grows in Psalms 1. Mm. Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Godly character isn't something that you're born with, or that you get from your parents, or through hard work, or through just making it happen. Godly character comes from meditating on, soaking on the Word of God. The Word of God produces character when we sit and we soak it up and then respond to it in our lives. And if you want to develop a life with godly character, we need to be like a tree planted by the river of God's word, soaking it up, letting it nourish in our lives. And the men and the women who lead our church must be people like this, who have so soaked up the word of God that it's produced godly character in them. Elders, pastors, leader, leaders of God's church must have a good reputation that's born out of godly character because reputation is like the shadow of that tree. And this reputation is supposed to be both inside the church as well as outside of the church. First one says, this is a trustworthy statement. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires a good work. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. Essentially the idea here is that no one who would be able to put anything on hold on your life. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means that you're, there's no glaring issues in your life, that your character has produced a reputation that's solid. People who have this reputation who are blameless he built this reputation by letting people into their world. That's why Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, certainly you know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You've seen my life, so you know that there's character there. Mike Thompson is someone I've known for years, and I've seen character there. Mike has flaws. He has shortcomings. I know those. But I also know that he loves Jesus, and he's proved that through his life and his character, the way he treats his wife, the way he treats his family, the way he loves people. This character that's been evident over time. And I only know that because I've spent lots of time with him. So if you are going to be a leader in God's church, you have to let people know you so they can examine your life and see your character, and that will come out. You also have to let people speak into your life when they see what's not good. When it's time to choose leaders, choose men and women who you've observed their life, you've seen their faith, their patience, their love. But it's not just our inside reputation, it's our reputation outside of the church. Down in verse 7, it says, People outside the church must speak well of him also, so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. We can be really churchy at church, and really worldly in the world. We can be um, kind of two-faced sometimes. And the world always smells of fake, and it brings down the name of Jesus. I suffer from a condition that's it's pretty serious, and it's something I've been struggling with for a long time now, and I've talked to the doctors about it. But I suffer from a condition called early onset grumpiness, um, <laughs> or underage crankiness. You know, I'm, only, I'm only 41, but I feel like Mr. Wilson some, sometimes. I'm like, get off my lawn, that's just kind of my motto, like a tattoo on my arm. Um, you know, so I came home on the 4th of July last year, or a couple years ago, and my neighborhood, this was, it was probably during COVID, yeah. So everyone was doing their own fireworks show. Oh, and not just like a little fireworks show, yeah. it's like the Disneyland fireworks uh -huh. show in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. And I see like my neighbors are shooting off rockets at my house. <laughs> and I come out there with a flashlight and I go into cop mode and like I'm channeling Michael Thompson. And like I've got my, <laughs> my flashlight like, scanning the yard and I'm taking command and control of the situation, yelling at my neighbors, like, what are you guys doing? You're going to burn my house down. Because I suffer, you see, from early onset grumpiness, <laughs> underage crankiness, which is fun <laughs> to some degree, but then it's really not fun afterwards. And, I, and I'm supposed to be like Jesus, the light of the world, and the salt of the earth, and all I am is salty. Um, and thankfully, this is one interaction of many, and, and I've since repaired that, that relationship with my neighbors. But it's a problem because he says you need to have a good reputation inside the church as well as outside the church if you're going to be a leader in God's church. 
question for you this morning. Who are you at work? Who are you in the community? Who are you as a boss or as an employee? Who are you in line, who are you in line at Chick-fil-A when it's like 45 cars long and your kid really has to pee? <laughs> who are you at that moment? I had this, uh, I'm, I'm a supervisor, and I had this employee who would just tell me about, yeah, I was listening to Kayla on the way into work, and it was, it was so great, God's word. And then they're just like this horrible employee. You know, like, are you Jekyll and Hyde, like two different people? What's going on? Because our reputation is a shadow of our character. And if we're going to be leaders in God's church, we need to have a good reputation both inside the church and outside the church. And so this list goes on to describe some other areas of character and reputation that are key. Elders, it says, must be, in verse 2, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable. So he says, leaders have to be sober-minded. We need leaders with good judgment who can make wise decisions in leadership. Literally, that word means a saved or a healed mind. It's interesting because Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Leaders who have a saved, healed, renewed mind in Christ are equipped to lead God's people into his perfect will. Because, listen up, our minds are jacked up. The way we think, the way that we act, the way that we make decisions, the way that we process life is all out of whack. It's all out of control. So it's just, if you're going to lead God's church, you need a saved, you need a healed mind that's being renewed. How do you get a renewed mind? Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, we read this in, uh, several months ago as GCC went through Ephesians, but it says, Correct, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Just like Jesus washes us with his word, if you're a follower of Jesus, he washes us clean. He makes us new through his word. The Word of God, it changes, it renews our opinions, our attitudes, our outlook on life, the way that we process things. It's changed through the Word. Titus 3 5 completes this thought when it says, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does a supernatural work in us, changing us and making us new. We begin to think differently about decisions and actions and the way that things are going on because He renews us. In in, his, in our minds. My friend, he became a Christian a few, probably 10 years ago or so, and he's he's like Mr. Conservative. He's super, super conservative. You know, InfoWars is, was plastered all over everything. That, that was him, which is fine. That's, that's, that's his bent. Um, but he said, after I became a Christian, my attitude and my outlook changed. My thoughts changed, and I became more liberal in some areas. Not that he gave up certain things that, you know, he was going to stick to this, but, um, his opinions change, not because his politics change, but his opinions change because the Word of God has so transformed his thoughts, his mind, because his mind is being renewed. And he said, in this area, my thoughts are wrong, they need to change. This area, I can hold, these ones are okay, but these ones need to change because that's what God's Word does, it renews our mind. We can have more compassion because of the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Next it says, leaders in God's church, elders need to be of good behavior. That word there is, is kind of, it's coming from the word, the word world or cosmos. Just like we look and we see order, you see summer and spring and fall in the world, you see all the order of creation. So too with leaders, you have to have order in your life. If you want to lead God's church but your own life is in complete disarray and lacks order, you need to grow in Jesus, you need to grow in this area. Sometimes we make the mistake of confusing spirituality and the spirit moving for chaos. You know, there's really no order because you're like, oh, I'm just following the spirit. What are you going to do today? I don't know. I'm just going to follow the spirit. You know, um, which is good. We want to follow the spirit, but we also need to have order in our lives. And the leaders in our church need to have order. They need to have ordered lives. So, what is the order to your life? What is the order to your life? If you're immature, you resist any structure or order, order, order in your life. You're like, don't tell me what to do. Don't put any parameters on my life. If you're going to be mature, then you have to submit your life to structure. Psalms 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Have you let the Lord order your life? Have you let the Lord change the way and structure the way that your life is? 
How is the Lord shaping your life? What do your routines look like? How is He shaping those? What about the rhythms of your life and your family? Are they ordered to be pleasing to God? Is your schedule so full that you're running in circles that there's no time for rest? There's no time for fellowship with other Christians? There's no time to read the Word of God? So how should you order and structure your life? You look to God's Word, you seek counsel from godly men and women, you ask the Holy Spirit to speak into these areas of your life, and you say, God, order me. Structure me in a way that's going to be pleasing to you. He goes on to say, leaders have to be hospitable, or to be a lover of hospitality, or a friend to strangers. Leaders in God's church are supposed to be hospitable. It's just kind of, really, it's evoking this idea of hospitality that we're really not familiar with in our world. So, I like to watch YouTube, I don't know if you guys do. You know, kind of just, I get on this YouTube rabbit trail, and the next thing you know, we're like watching people build sheds and all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> um, but there's this one guy who goes, just travels all around the world, and he was in the Middle East, and it's just amazing to me. He goes, and he's in Saudi Arabia, which you think, you know, it's like a place full of terrorists or something, you know, it's dangerous. And he's just going around randomly, and he goes in front of someone's house, and they see him, and they invite him in, and they say, oh, come have tea with us, and come meet our family, and come hang out with us. That's not hospitality that we do. When people drive by my street, I really honestly like grumpy you know, <laughs> Turn the music down, get off my street, you know. Um, and, and they're inviting people into their homes, they're offering them tea, they're sitting down in their homes, they're, you know. That's a hospitality that's foreign to us, but really that's the hospitality that's spoken of here. Yeah. Leaders in God's church are the people who invite others in. Because when you come on a Sunday and you've been in church before, it's a little scary. And the leaders are the people who are bringing you in. Leaders who are who are saying, I want to share my life with you. I want your life to be part of mine. Jesus, it's, this is important because this is what Jesus does for us. He is hospitable. Jesus invites us to his table to have communion, to have fellowship, to have friendship with him. Jesus steps into our world to be into the place where we are. And Jesus invites us into his world, his reality, to experience the reality of heaven. Leaders in God's church should do both. We step into the world of others, getting to know them, listening to them, serving them. Just a quick note on that. When you're working with someone, I know Mike just had to do a funeral last night. Leaders or those people who are aspiring to be leaders, you think, what am I going to say? And you kind of like start running through you know, all the Bible verses you know, and you're trying to think of something. There's a ministry of listening, of just letting people speak, letting people talk. And that's what he's calling leaders to do, to be people who are hospitable, just listen, and just take in what's going on. We also, as leaders, we invite people into the reality of Jesus. So your home may be broken down, but Jesus' home is a palace. And he says, I'm inviting you into my life, into my reality. And so we meet people who have no hope, who have no peace, and we invite them into that reality of hope and peace, of hospitality. Are you willing to step into the lives of other people and invite them into yours? Are you going to be mature in faith? If you are, you must learn radical hospitality. That chases after the stranger and says, come, get part of what we're doing. So the next theme, we, we go from character and we go into control. From this theme, we move into the theme of control. Why? Because the fruit of character is seen in a controlled life. So I had the opportunity to go to go this camp out in the middle of nowhere called Ironwood a couple of weeks ago. And I've been invited to go to this place many times. I think Mike even invited me once. I was like, I'm not going to the middle desert for camp. That sounds horrible. Um, I want to go like I want to go to Oakland for camp. You know, trees and grass and greenery. And so I went out to Ironwood, and Ironwood is just ranch out in the middle of nowhere. And we got the symbol, thank you, Mike. Um, and so this is their symbol, this this eye, it's an eye and it's broken. And they tell the story about why that eye is broken. And they actually have wild horses out there that they've actually broken these horses and made them usable. So I got to ride on one, and it was pretty fun. I almost fell off. Um, but these wild horses who, who've never been touched before and who could be actually very, very dangerous are brought under submission to be able to be useful and have connection with the masters. And so they break these horses who are just crazy, running around wild, and they put saddles on them, and people are actually able to ride them and enjoy them. And, and do useful things with them. So just like a wild horse must be broken to be useful, if I'm going to be useful in the kingdom of God, I have to be broken. I have to have the passions of my life brought under control. In verse 3, it lists several areas where elders and pastors are to be under control. 
And each one really deals with our passions that need to be broken. Verse 3 says, He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. So drinking heavily, acting out in violence, always arguing and starting a conflict. You know those people like, you're like, hey, it's sunny out today. Like, not really. <laughs> you know, whatever you say, that there's there's a counter argument. They're just there's a chip on the shoulder. Everything's an argument. Everything's a conflict. Um, or people who love money and pursuing it. And you think about the leaders of the church. It's pretty pretty important that they're not really into money because that could really go south really quickly. <laughs> All these areas that are passions that uncontrolled can really make us unusable in the kingdom of heaven. Like those wild horses, you know. I was out in Nevada one time, and I just saw these wild horses running around. It's, it's a beautiful sight to see these wild horses out there. Like, man, this is amazing. It's, it's just beautiful. But they're not useful. You can't do anything with them. They're wild horses that, because they're not broken, they're not useful. If we're going to be useful in the kingdom of heaven, we have to allow God to break our passions that we might be under control of him. So what do we do? How do you break free from these things? How does God break us in these areas? Jesus said this in John 15, 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. Galatians 5, 22 goes on to say what that fruit is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Really the opposite of all these problems that we discussed a minute ago. Here's the point. As I'm focused on loving God and being connected to Him, it begins to consume my life and my desires change and what I want changes and what I care about changes. Because I love God, He changes my desires. He breaks my passions because I'm focused on Him. So you ask me, people ask, oh, so what's your favorite movie? What kind of movies do you like to watch and say, British period dramas? I say that. <laughs> Because that's not really my favorite movie, it's because that's what my wife likes. And so when you love somebody, your desires change. If you're going to stay married, you love what your wife loves, pretty much. That's how it goes. I've been married for 20 years, so I can say this works. Um, and so you ask me what I love, and I say, I love what my wife loves, because I love her. And the thing is, as we love Jesus, with all of our heart, we focus on Him. It's something beautiful and supernatural and simple happens. Fruit in my life begins to grow. Love turns into joy, patience, gentleness, self-control, and all the things that God believers need. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus spoke this way, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things that we added up to you. So it's a really simple principle. As we love Jesus, he starts to break down our passions and things that are not of him. And he starts to fill them with the opposite as we love him. It's not something you seek and you strive and you work at necessarily, and you can. It's probably helpful to some degree. But really, we just love Jesus. And we love Jesus with all our heart. And these things start to change in us because we love what he loves. And he starts to break us and make us useful. You don't need a 12 step program, you need one step. Love God and let that love break you in all the places that God desires. If you're going to lead God's church, let the love of God break your passions and change your desires. And then transitions to this last area. So we talked about character and control, and this last area is commitment. So um, <clears throat> many, many years ago, I got to spend some time in Iowa. I spent a summer working at a summer camp there, and I got to go out to some of the farms, and you see cornfields as far as the eye can see, and it's actually like disconcerting. Because you step in about a foot and you realize, if I keep going, I'm going to get lost and die in a cornfield. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> um, and, and so cornfields, they look beautiful from a distance. You get close and you realize it's a little bit scary. But the point is, is that the harvest, you see these corn stalks that are you know, maybe 8, 10, 12, 15 feet tall. You're seeing a harvest that was planted months and months before. You're seeing the work of a farmer who's put a little seed in the ground many, many months before. If leaders in God's church have real character and real self-control, you will see the fruit of that in their relationships and their gifting. And it happens over time. The harvest you're seeing is a result of many years of plowing, watering, and sowing faithfulness. And so when we evaluate potential leaders in God's church, we look at their relationships and their gifts because that's the result of the harvest. That's a harvest that you're seeing in that relationship that was planted a long time before. So he starts to deal with husbands and wives. Verses 1 and 2, if someone aspires to be a church leader, he must be faithful to his wife, 
or a husband of one wife. You see, sexual sin, infidelity have ruined more pastors than any other thing, and it's destroyed the church and the faith of many. Over the past few months, GCC was in the book of Ephesians, and we read this from Ephesians 5, 25, Husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And so I think a lot of us who are husbands, like I said, I've been married for 20 years and done this a while, and you think, I'm doing a good job. I'm faithful to my wife, sexually. I haven't cheated on anybody. I'm doing good. Many, many years ago, I was, uh, when I was in high school and college, I went to packing house in Redlands, and Pastor Ed Ray was teaching uh, a section of scripture, and he said this, many men are willing to die for their wives, but are you willing to live for her? Here's the problem. You can be sexually faithful, but you can be emotionally and relationally distant. This goes for both husbands and wives. You can be married to your wife, but you can be in love with your job or your truck <laughs> or your kids' sports team and coaching it and them being all-stars or your ministry if you're in ministry. You can be married to your wife but have no clue what she's concerned about this week. You don't know what her hopes, her fears, her regrets are because you don't talk to her. You can be married, but you can lack true depth, intimacy, and friendship. Friends, it should not be. I mean, God is calling you to not just be faithful to your wives, but to faithfully love them, to spend time with them, to have intimate friendship with them, to share your hopes, dreams, and fears, to grow together in your relationship with Christ, to let this one woman have all of your heart, to be a one woman man. This is the kind of men we want to lead us because that faithfulness, that care, that intimacy, it's a picture of Jesus, our true senior pastor. In reality, this is the calling for each married couple in this church to be faithful in our relationships and to be all in, to not hold anything back from one another. Men, are you a one-woman man giving all of yourself to your wife? Ladies, are you a one-man woman giving all of yourself to your husband? This is the will of God for our lives, and especially for those who lead the church. If we have godly character, we're going to see healthy, committed marriages. So when you're going to pick a leader, look for somebody who's sown seeds many years ago, and you're seeing the hardest of that in your relationships. He moves on to family in verse 4. He must manage his own family while having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own house, how can he take care of God's church? I was listening years ago to uh, Pastor Skip Isaac out of Albuquerque, and he said, if your faith doesn't work at home, don't export it. <laughs> Which is true. If your faith doesn't work in your own life, why share with anyone else? And so he says, if, if you have a family, you need to be a good steward of your family. You guys have been stewards and blessed with some children. Maybe you've been steward and blessed with a husband or a wife. Um, or maybe you have a uh, People you have influence over your life. You have a stewardship there. If you have a family, God has entrusted that family to, to you to lead them well, to teach them, to model love and grace and truth for them, to keep them on track. Anybody can do ministry and serve the church, but God has uniquely called you to lead your family and to care for them. So here's a, here's a question for you. What if you're really, really godly, but your family is really, really a mess? Let's talk about reality now, right? <laughs> You're really, really godly, but your family is really, really mess. Many years ago at a church we used to attend, after I first got married, there was this missionary family. A lot of the families in the church were part of Mission Radiation Fellowship, um, so these are missionaries around the world. And they were just faithful, godly, awesome people who loved God like no one else. And they were in Papua New Guinea or some other place like that, I can't remember where. But their son, their teenage son started to go off the rails, and he started to somehow use drugs and just, just really have all kinds of issues. And so they made the hard choice to leave their ministry and to come back to Redlands and, and just to live here, kind of a normal life. But they're still doing everything. These are the people who are bringing everyone to church. You know, they picked up like half the neighborhood they brought them to church. Uh, one, one, one week there was this lady, who pretty sure it was a prostitute, that they brought into <laughs> to church. These people loved Jesus completely, but their family was still a mess to some degree. What do you do with that? Does that mean you're not qualified to lead anybody else? Listen, as a godly father or mother, your job is to plow a field with straight lines, to sow seeds and to water them and to watch them grow. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7 says, Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted a seed in your hearts, Paul's watered it, but it was God who made it grow. 
It's not important who does the planting or does the water. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. As a godly parent, there's nothing more than you want for your kids to love Jesus, to follow after him, to live right. It's so good to see your kids and follow Jesus and love your hands. That's what you want. For those of you who dedicated your kids this morning, that's what you want. That's what we all want. The problem is this. We can't make the seeds grow ourselves. I can plant them, I can water them, but I can't make them grow. As much as I, as much as I want to, as much as I try, I can't do that. We can only sow seeds of faith and water them. We have to trust God for the growth, and especially if we see them going the wrong way. And unfortunately, you can't control your children as they grow older. How many of you parents have had adult children who have strayed from the faith? It's so difficult. What are they doing? You know, we've raised them differently. Why are they going this direction? Does that mean that you're not qualified to lead God's church? No. He says, I've called you to, to plant and to, um, to sow straight lines and trust God for the growth. What does faithfulness look like in parenting? My daughter is going to be 18 soon, so I've done it. She's off in college. I've uh, got to experience what that's like for many years. But parenting, faithfulness in parenting is this. It's a commitment to teaching and speaking the word of God in your home. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 puts it this way. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them and begin again to your children. And talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as a reminder. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Listen, discipleship happens along the way. Whether it be with your kids, your neighbors, your coworkers, discipleship happens along the way. So he says, speak to your kids when you rise up and when you go down. So when you get up in the morning, bless the Lord, kids, it's a great day. When you put them at the end of the day, you pray with them, you read God's word with them, you share with them. I remember taking my daughter out when she was probably six months, a year, two years old, I don't know. And we're looking at the stars and see who made those stars. Jesus made those stars. You know, every little bit of your life, you take a walk, you enjoy that. Everything you do, you point out to Scripture, you point out to who Jesus is doing. And that's that faithfulness that you're planting these straight rows and you're trusting God for the growth. You speak about the Word of God in everyday things of life. You pray with your kids and you pray for your kid. Maybe you pray with them when they're sleeping because that's the only time that they're quiet and still. When they're, when they're awake, you're thinking, you know, maybe I need an exorcist. When they're sleeping, you can pray for them. You, know? um, you can, and that's what we can do. You take them to church and be a dictator about it if needs be. Um, this is my, just my advice to you parents who get young kids. When they get to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, they're going to rebel. They're not going to want to come to church. You bring them to church. <laughs> bring them to church because you're not going to regret that. You know, trust God with, with uh, growth, but you bring them to church. That's your, that's your job. Do it. And be faithful to that. Don't make it optional. Make it expected. This is what we do as a family. This is how we love and serve Jesus. We're coming. You can sit there with a frown if you want to, but you're going to be here. Do it, family. So also, model love, grace, and faithfulness. Let them see the goodness and beauty of God play out in the way you parent them. This is going to sound a little bit odd, but one time my daughter um, was doing something very bad when she was a kid. She often did. <laughs> Because that's what kids do. And it's, I, I had to, my challenge was always to not laugh when she did something bad. Because I'm a dad and kids are cute and they're fun. But one time she just did something and, and it was really, it was really spank worthy. You know, like, it's like, <laughs> this kid needs a spanking. You know, this kid needs a little, a little bit of the, the, the love and fear of God into them. And I just had this, this, this thought at the moment, and I'm not saying this is what you should do at all times, or maybe this is even right for everyone, but for me at that moment, I felt like God says, do something different this time around. And so I put my arm up, and I told my daughter, I want you to take this little, uh, this little stick that I was going to spank you with, I want you to just hit my arm with it. A little unconventional. <laughs> and she was a kid, but she was blown away by that. What? what? You want me to hit you, Daddy? Yes, I want you to hit me with a stick, because I was trying to demonstrate to my daughter, mm -hmm. this is grace. Jesus takes, he takes what we deserve, because he loves us and he wants to know us, he wants to be in relationship with us. Parents, want to love, grace, and faithfulness to your kids. 
Here's caution. If your kids are going off the rails, it might be a warning light that you need to shift your focus temporarily away from ministry. It's not that you're not qualified. It's not that God hasn't called you, but he's only given your kids to you. And so if you ever get to that point, sometimes you have to make the hard call and focus on your kids, focus on your family, because that's important. No one else is going to care for your kids like you do. So finally, it gets to our ability to teach. So if a leader has a great ability to teach the Word of God, chances are, again, you're seeing the harvest of something that started a really long time before. Their godly character or diligence or ordered life has produced fruit. This word phrase, able to teach, is interesting because the word can both mean one who is taught and one who teaches. Leaders are learners, and leaders must be teachable. God, good and godly leaders will both be taught by the word, able, excited, and willing to teach to others. But if the word doesn't first impact your own life, and you're not willing to receive instruction and teaching, you're going to be a terrible and most likely a toxic leader because the word hasn't impacted your own life. So able to teach means somebody who's, who sits under the word and who is also able to teach it. And again, you're seeing the fruit of that that happens over time. Question for you. Really remember, this isn't just a model, it's a map. Model and a map to Christian maturity. Question for you, are you willing to be taught by the Word of God? Are you willing to hear what it says and just do it? Are you just as eager to be taught God's Word as you are to teach it? That's why it says here in verse 6 that elders and pastors shouldn't be new to the faith because they'll just become prideful. Because they'll tell other people what the Word of God says, but they haven't applied it to their own lives yet. And that's something, again, that takes time to let that soak in as we grow so really, really briefly, because again, I don't want your kids to be your older by the time you leave. Um, just going to touch on Deacon's for just a moment. So really, the spirit of the text is, is pretty similar for the requirements for deacons. Remember, deacons are the people who are leading some of the practical elements of ministry. So these are the people who are in control of our counting our money, making sure our finances are on track, uh, making sure we have some of the logistical things that we need, taking care of the practical matters of ministry. These are super important jobs. One thing that's missing in the list of deacons, though, is a teaching ability. So deacons are focused on the practical business of, of the church, but teaching is not a requirement for these roles. It's not, it doesn't mean that you don't have that gift, it just means it's not required, which is great news because you're like, I can't teach, I'm afraid of speaking to anybody. Um, great news, God has a place for you in this church, and maybe it's in the practical side of the ministry. But don't discount people who are doing practical things. Some of the, the, the practical people are the most godly people you ever meet. We read about this in Acts when they choose Stephen to, to do the food ministry. So his whole job is to like distribute food. So he's like, here's a piece of bread, here's a piece of bread. Doesn't sound very spiritual. But it says Stephen was a man who was full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And then he has like this mighty showdown with uh, the Jewish leaders and he gets stoned to death. It's a great story. Um, great, great encouragement for you once you do But um, But my point in that is that some of the, the most godly people are the people who are just doing the practical things of ministry. And don't ever discount that. And don't discount that if that's you. The other thing that's different here is gender rules. So verse 11 says, in the same way their wives must be respected and must not slander others and must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. So elders, pastors, it's very clear that it's, that it's a role for men because that's how God has ordered things in his church. And I know Mike touched on this last week. Um, but when it comes to deacons, those who are in charge of the practical elements of ministry, the original language doesn't really speak, it says wives, but it's not really what the language and the context means. Really, the, the word is woman. So the idea is that it gives some requirements for male deacons and it gives some requirements for female deacons who are in charge of the practical elements of ministry. So in actually in Romans 16.1, he talks about a female deacon named Phoebe who served at the church in the area of Corinth. So we know that Biblically, the structure allows for women to be in this area. So, good news, women. You're not discarded. You're not, as Mike said last week, you are so valued. God has such a place for you in this church. And Mike will go into more of this, I'm sure, in the coming weeks. But it's great stuff. Anyways, and then there's also a warning for deacons. It says, deacons likewise must be reverent, not double-tongued. And verse 11 says, in the same way, women must be respected and must not stand with others. So it's interesting, for both men and women who serve as deacons, there seems to be a warning against being dishonest and slandering or speaking evil of others. I think sometimes there's a temptation, I know this because I've given into it, to 
to think we know better than those who lead us. And to, you know, maybe, you, maybe you're not in charge, maybe you think, well, I'm just going to cut them down a little bit. In other words, if I was in charge, it would be better. If I was in charge, I would do it this way. This is something we can't be engaged in. It's another part of our lives that needs to be brought under submission to Jesus. Because if we're going to lead, we're being tested as deacons. And he says, work these things out. If you're going to grow in the church, work these things out. And so my question for you is, who have you slandered or spoken about dishonestly? You know who it is. I know who it is. I've thought about that. I've done that. Today's the day to stop doing that. We've all done that. Today's the day to stop doing that. As we love Jesus, as we focus on him, we're going to let that love flow out of us and be able to love other people and not speak evil of them. So as we bring this to a, close, to a close, as I mentioned at the beginning, this text isn't just a model for leadership, it's a map for Christian maturity. Jesus wants you to grow up in the faith and walk in the reality of heaven. He wants to develop character in you. It's like a tree with roots that grow deep into God's word. He wants your life to be under control as you submit more and more to him as his love produces fruit in your life. He wants to develop character that will be worked out in your commitments, in your relationships, in your giftings that will be deep, fulfilling, and godly. My question for you this morning as we close is, how is God leading you to respond to his word? Is there an area of your mind that needs to be renewed by the Word of God? Is there something in your life that is wild, kind of a crazy horse that's out of control that needs to be broken by the Lord? Is the Spirit inviting you to go deep in your connection to Jesus and abide in His love? Husbands, wives, are you giving all of yourselves to one another? Or does, is there something else or someone else that holds your affection? Parents, are you being faithful to speak to your kids about the Word of God, to sow the straight lines of Scripture, of faith? What if the Spirit is saying this morning, I encourage you to do business with the Lord this morning? The Lord invites you to come boldly into His presence this morning, experience His mercy, grace, and help. And He wants to do good things in you through His Word. So this Scripture, it's a model, it's a map for Christian maturity. Let these things shape you and form you as we look at his word. So as we move into this final song of worship, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. I want you guys to take a moment as you're worshiping to say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What is it that you have for me? And simply respond to him. Oh, please.